Can you guys can you guys hear me? All right, praise God. Praise God. If you have your Bibles with you, if you can go to Philippians chapter 3. Chapter 4. <laughs> chapter 4. I'm like, that was last week. Sorry, guys. And um, we're not going to read the text just yet. I, I, I wrote something down. And I, I, want, I wanted to read this to you guys. And then here's what's going to happen. I'm going to read this. And then I want to take just like a good maybe two minutes of just prayer. So there's going to be a moment of prayer, and you'll see what it leads into. But if you're writing notes tonight, here's the title of today's sermon. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. I wrote this for those in this room who may be relating to the passage But I just wanted to share this to people who are dealing with these things as of now. If you're in a difficult season in your life right now, this is for you. I want you to hear closely. Do not worry, those of you right now who have little faith. Tonight, I want to speak to you. Those of you who feel like your life is in a season of obscurity. You don't know what's going to happen next. You you can't see the other side across wherever season you're in. If you're in that space right now, I want you to know this tonight. Do not worry. Those who are living right now in a moment of confusion and despair, listen, do not fret, do not worry, and do not be afraid. Those haunted by the night, those going through serious trials, And the heavy burdens of life that demand answers. Do not fret. Do not be afraid. Those of you who are constantly moving in and out of a hospital right now. Don't worry. Those of you living in broken homes. Don't worry. Those of you in toxic relationships. With a woman or with a man. Don't fret. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Those of you working in unfulfilling jobs right now, you hate it there, don't worry and don't be afraid. Those who are lost and just lacking motivation and a reason to wake up tomorrow, those of you who really feel like your life has just no purpose, you're at the end, and no one knows it but you, I don't know if I want to wake up tomorrow anymore. This is for you. Do not fret. Our Lord takes care of birds, flowers, and all of His creatures. And He will provide for your needs. And He will nourish your souls. He will support those who seek guidance in His Word. And He will be with those who trust in His promises. So repeat this after me. If you can, if you got no strength in you to say it with all authority, that's okay. I invite you to just whisper it if you can. Whisper this with me. Just whisper it. It is well with my soul. Let's say it again. It is well with my soul. When you're scared, when you're lost in confusion, Sing that favorite hymn and say that phrase. It is well with my soul because Christ is guiding me home. So here's what we're going to do. If this doesn't apply to you, just remain silent. But if this does apply to you, just pray. Don't look at the person next to you. If you want, you just bow your head right where you are. Everyone just bow your heads right where you are. I'm looking at you. (laughs) And I'm going to get this guitar. And uh, I'm going to, no, can you pass me my phone over there? Let me see it over there. And uh, I'm I'm just going to play this little bridge from a famous song we know, It Is Well. And I, I just wanted us to sing it a little bit tonight. Maybe you don't want to pray, you just want to sing. That's cool too. 
I'm all for it. The Bible tells us to greet each other in hymns and songs and spiritual songs. And I just want to trust God right now. Oh, man. Okay, I think I'm good here. Okay. So right where you are. Sing it, church. going to pray now. Father, I pray for every soul in this room that they would know that you who made all things are carrying them right now. You see their pain, their tears, their brokenness. Tell them, Lord, that all is well because their souls are in your hands, Father. Let us trust in you, God. Speak through the text tonight. And in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. <sighs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 through 20. Paul's in prison. He speaks to his brothers in Philippi. And this is what he says to them in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, says Paul. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. 
to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Tonight's sermon is about being well in the soul. And for the soul to be well, it must learn one particular virtue, contentment. Young person, are you content in Christ? Are you content with your life? Or are you frustrated at the season at which you're in? Are you angry at the days that which you face right now? Do you grumble and complain, or are you truly content because of Christ? Three things this text teaches us. Number one, contentment is to be learned. Contentment is to be learned. If you're writing notes, this is for you. Contentment is to be learned. Number two, contentment grants peace in hardship. Contentment will grant you peace in trials and hardship. And last but not least, contentment does not nullify need. It doesn't nullify it. Let's begin with the first reflection tonight. Consider verses 10 and 11. Paul says this, I rejoice in the Lord. Once again, we're confronted with the word rejoice. He's in prison, but he's rejoicing still. He feels alone, but he's strengthened by God. There he is in chains, knowing Christ is his joy. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. And look at verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Here, notice, Paul says that he's learned this. It takes lessons Seasons, trials to learn the value of contentment. You can't just sit here and say, I'm going to be content. Get ready for situations in your life that will rob you of the peace and joy of remaining steadfast and content. It's something that the mature Christian will have if he trusts his life into Christ. First thing about learning contentment is that in order to learn, you must go to one who teaches. And who is our great teacher? Christ. Let us remember that we are forever students to the great teacher that is Christ. I am so frightened that there are people who call themselves Christians today and feel like they know more than Christ. And I am frightened by Christians who think they still don't have lessons to learn. I mean, there are people who really go, man, I already read Matthew. I get it. I already know the Bible. You sure about that? You really think you know all the lessons that come in and out of it? Does your life look like it understands all the truths you've read? Because if your life isn't reflecting the truths you've read, then you actually don't know anything. I know I should trust in God, but but do you actually know? Do you trust in God? I, I know God is all authority and I should fear no man. Do you still fear men? Because if you do, then you still don't get it. And that's why forever we are students in this school of the gospel with one great teacher, a great teacher, a wonderful teacher, Jesus. He is a teacher who will not be tired of your questions, who will never push you away because you are afraid or concerned or confused. He is a teacher always so quick to listen to all who call on him. Our earthly teachers aren't like that. Y'all know that. You go to school. I don't get the question, teacher. I'll I'll repeat it one more time. I still don't get it, teacher. I'll try one more time. Teacher, I I, I must be dumb. I still don't get it. Maybe you are dumb. Maybe you should leave this class. (laughs) That's the world. Jesus never looks at you and says you're dumb. And he never looks at you and says you're nothing or worthless. He looks at you as a son and a daughter. And he says, I'll teach you all day if you let me. You can come and ask me whatever you want. I'll be your teacher forever. If you would just allow yourself to be his student. The first words uttered by the disciples in John chapter 1 verse 38 literally was rabbi. When they first confronted Jesus, the first thing they said to him was teacher. Teacher, where do you go? Can you teach us, oh teacher? Young person, did you go to Christ simply for the crutch of having forgiveness and to remove the shame of your life? Or did you actually go to Christ so that he teach you wonders? Did you go to Christ, going to Christ, just because Christ is enough? And did you go to Christ with the desire to live like him and to go wherever he goes, accepting the lessons that he brings into your life? 
Because there are many lessons and many valleys to cross with him. Will you have the courage to follow him? Consider Peter when he's confronted with Christ himself who says, will you leave? He says to the great teacher, where shall we go? You hold the words of eternal life. You're not like any other teacher, oh Jesus. If there's anyone who's going to teach us contentment, it's him. Not me. Not some book in Barnes and Nobles. Not some motivational video on YouTube. Not some guru or some false prophet. It's just Christ. Christ will teach you how to be content. And Christ will show you that he is your satisfaction. Because he truly is our treasure. If you just allow him to teach you. In the Great Commission, Jesus says this in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And remember this, that I am always with you, even to the end of the age. So it's not just, want to know how to go to heaven? It's, want to know Christ? He'll lead you into heaven. He'll also sanctify you and lead you into being humble. And he'll also lead you into having the joy you've never had before. And he'll also lead you into contentment. And he'll also lead you into wisdom. Oh, this teacher is not like any other teach you. teacher. He will teach you things you have never learned before. And when you compare it to your earthly teachers, you're going to realize, oh, there's no one like him. There really is no one like him. He tells me to forgive my enemies. Everyone told me to hate my enemies. He told me to love my neighbor and not just tolerate him, but love him. And he told me that if I put the kingdom of God above all things, everything will be added to me. Because there is no other reason for what I was made for. I was made for a kingdom. I was made for a king. I was made to serve him. Young person, you were made for a king. You were not made to live a mediocre life. You were not created to live in the suburbs, retire at 70, and, and be there with your wife to the day you die. God wants to send some of you to jungles, mountains, valleys. God wants to send you to the end of the earth to help and assist and be his hands and his feet. But are you willing to trust the teacher? Or will you keep playing it safe? Guys, one of my biggest fears is to be 70, 80 years old, and I just lived a boring life. I didn't trust the teacher. I didn't take the risk because I didn't understand what faith was actually about. Faith is not about knowing what's going to happen next. It's about trusting God despite what happens next. It's about I'm going I'm to follow God wherever he takes me. If it means i got to go with Angel to FIU this week, I'm going. If it means i got to go uh, to my home and tell mom and dad about Christ, I'm going. And I'm not going to live this comfortable life because everyone tells me to. I was made for a kingdom. And there's a teacher who has so many lessons to teach me. And one of those lessons is contentment. Paul says he learned contentment from being with Christ. In order to learn these things, you must know these three things. Number one, you must learn to speak less and listen more. You talk too much, stop talking. Or God will never teach you anything. You think you got all the answers? Today's the day where you realize you don't. You want to know why your walk with Christ is so stale? It's because you really think you're still the teacher in this, and you're not. You're the student. So be quiet and listen more to God. And if you're going to open your mouth, open your mouth for Christ. Open your mouth for Christ. Number two, to even listen to this teacher, you have to trust this teacher. You have to have faith in his reigning authority. So I'm not just telling you, you should try, Jesus. I'm telling you to let go of your life and follow Jesus. And I'm asking you to trust him. And I wonder if some of you actually do. Guys, if Jesus came into this room and said, when I leave out of these doors, you'll never see your family again. You trust him? Or is mom and dad and my brother and sister still more important than God in the flesh? He can't teach you anything if you still love things more than him. So it's not just enough to tolerate Jesus. It's trusting that he really knows all things. 
that this teacher is the truth. And there are no other truths that even come close to his voice. He is the word of God. And when he speaks, we listen solely to him. Don't listen to me. Listen to him. And if you are listening to me, pray it's because you're hearing him through me. But I put myself on the spot. I wish most pastors did. If you don't hear Christ coming out of my mouth, stop listening now. But what I'm telling you, what am I telling you? To listen to him. We must decrease. He must increase. He's our teacher. Do you trust him? And last but not least, do you love his commands? Some of you will sit here and tell me, I love Jesus, and not realize you don't love his commands. Jesus says, how can you say you love me if you don't obey my commands? Don't sit here and have some false affection for Christ you think is found in a song, in a prayer, or in a life group, or in a program in a church. That's not what it means to love Christ. Christ says, you love me? Then when I tell you to do something, do it. I mean, you say you love me. So when I say go, you go. And when I say forgive, you forgive. And when I say to be pure, you remain pure. And when I say that you're not of this world, you realize that that's the truth. And you don't wrestle with him because you love him. You know why you wrestle with him? Because you still don't love him. Until you tap out and surrender and realize there's nowhere else to go and that you just love him, my friends, he will lead you to green pastures. He is the great shepherd. He will lead you to righteousness always. And let me tell you something about this shepherd. He will never, ever hurt you. When you follow him, he does it all for his glory. And even though the discipline seems painful, because it is, it's always for your good. Jesus is not an abusive father. He's just a good father. And he will not spare his rod. Sometimes he's going to hit you behind the head and say, focus. Sometimes he's going to tell you, stop what you're doing and stop being a child and grow up. Paul said it. I put childish things away. Guys, for some of us, we just got to grow up. We're just in the same season, doing the same things for years. And my question here is, who's teaching you? Because it doesn't sound like it's Christ. Especially when you've yet to be satisfied in him. Contentment is about satisfaction. So we must learn to be satisfied in Christ. When we apply the precepts I told you of speaking less, of trusting more, and loving his commands, we will not only be joyful, but we will be satisfied. Before you knew Christ, what did you chase? Think about it. You got the person next to you. Think about it. What were you chasing? Money? How'd that go? What were you chasing? Someone's touch, a woman's touch, to be in your bed. Oh, she touched me. She kissed me. You had sex. H how'd that go? Uh, I was chasing a, a career. You got it. How's that going? You chase people's acceptance. Everyone's proud of the person you are, but you hate the person you see in the mirror. How's that going? Being a people pleaser. Guys, apart from Christ, there's no satisfaction in the soul. It's like a person who's thirsty drinking salt water the whole time. You're just going to keep getting more and more thirsty living for the world apart from Christ. And it may seem temporarily, well, something's there, right? And it's just salt. And you're more and more thirsty. You're dehydrated. Thank you. That's actually how it is apart from Christ. Jesus teaches us that man should not live on bread alone, but on every word of God. Jesus teaches us in John chapter 4 when he speaks to the Samaritan woman, you will drink of this water and you will thirst. But the water that which I give you, you will never thirst again if you drink from it. It is living water. The life that Christ is willing to provide for you is a life that will have you satisfied in your souls. And the person next to you at your job who doesn't know Christ, listen to me, they are not satisfied. They can smile and laugh, but when they go to bed all alone, 
There it remains, the shallow emptiness of their souls. And you can act tough all you want. You're not that strong. You need to be broken and weakened by Christ. Christ is not looking for all these tough people who think they have it all figured out. He's looking for the one who realizes, I'm tired of acting like I have it figured out. I'm tired of trying to be so strong when I'm not. I'm tired of thinking I have control for things when I don't. And once you say, that's it, Lord. Can you just come, Lord, and find me and help me, please? I just need your help now. I'm done. There he comes with a great teacher to teach you that no one will satisfy you more than him. And as you learn the lesson that Christ is enough, you start realizing in your trials, in your tribulations, that Christ is the one who grants the contentment. Not the things, not the circumstances, just the Christ. He is the treasure to the believer. Nothing can be desired more than Christ, Christian. There's not a square inch on earth more precious and valuable than his presence. Nothing is more valuable than him. We must learn to be still in his presence and be at ease with him. Contentment in the dictionary is described as feeling mentally or emotionally satisfied with one current circumstance. In today's society, it is very uncommon to find individuals who are genuinely content with their lives. The Bible emphasizes the importance of being content with what we have, with who we are, and our future, because all of it is in the hands of Christ. God did not create you to be worried. You understand that? You're worried? It's not from God. He didn't say, hey, I suggest you guys not be worried. He said, do not be worried. It's a command. You're anxious? That's not a personality trait. That's the fallenness of your sin. And there are people who will normalize it. You're just anxious. No, I'm not just anxious. I'm sinful and I worry because I think things are under my control when they're not. And Christ is saying, let go. Stop thinking you have control. You don't. So just let go and have faith in him. The Bible describes it in Psalms 23. He talks about being a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. It, it says, though I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Can you just imagine this? Imagine if everyone just transformed to a sheep, weird. <laughs> just all a bunch of sheep hanging out the mix, bah, weird. <laughs> just a bunch of sheep hanging out. And can you imagine, I mean, just really try, if you have the imagination for it. I like visualizing things. Can you imagine Jesus with his rod, and he's just standing before us, and you're just this little sheep, and you're staring at this robe. You don't even look at any, you just see this robe and his feet, and you see this staff that's there. And Christ says, this staff is here to comfort you, that when a wolf comes, I'm going to hit that wolf to get away from you. And all he's saying is, follow the shepherd. Follow me. That's Christ. Everyone else is getting swallowed up by wolves and trials and tribulations, and there's this narrow path, and Jesus says, just focus on me. I promise I'll get you to the other side. I always say this to my brothers. I always say, uh, I know pastors, you know, the word pastor comes from shepherd, but I always say, I don't feel like I'm the shepherd. I feel like I'm like a sheepdog. <laughs> you know, I feel like there's just one shepherd and his name is Jesus. And I think pastors like sheepdogs just barking at everyone to step in line. <laughs> like, get in line, get in line. Everyone, hoo, hoo. <laughs> follow the shepherd. He's right in front of you. What are you doing? No, you're going the wrong way. Get over here. And you know what's the most beautiful thing about the shepherd? He will leave 99 sheep to find you. So maybe you think you're just a face buried in a crowd. For him, he'll leave everyone in this room to look for you just to tell you that he's your shepherd and that he is the only one who will satisfy you. So be content being in the hands of him. Jesus says to not worry. Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is, li is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes. 
Maybe some of you are wrestling right now with some of these needs. God sees your needs. So don't worry. Because life is so much more than just food and clothing. Life is so much more than going to school and getting a job and getting married. Life is so much more than all these things. Because life is actually about one person, and his name is Christ. So, so if there was a huge painting, we're just like this little piece in the painting, and at the center is this king on a throne, and his name is Jesus. You're not the center of the world, and you're not, you shouldn't be the center of your own world. You should just be a vessel and a student following a great shepherd. You're a sheep. But the shepherd is good, and he'll protect you from the wolves of your life. Contentment is to be learned. Let us learn from Christ. The second reflection we get from this passage is that contentment grants peace in hardships and tribulations. If you have your Bibles, look at verse 12 and 13 where Paul says this. After learning contentment, he says in verse 12, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Consider Paul and his instruction. He learned contentment. And this school of contentment brought him peace in the midst of his trials. This verse emphasizes the idea that God provides the strength to endure any situation. Okay. Who here watches like uh, boxing? Anyone know boxing? Raise your hand if you know boxing. Some of the men know boxing. Raise your hand if you know who Mike Tyson is. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay. Imagine I got someone who's never boxed a day in his life. Never boxed. Lanky arms. Never did any push-ups. Just weak. And he decides to stand against Mike Tyson. I know it sounds crazy, right? And he tells Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson, let's fight. Come on, you and me. And Mike Tyson goes, I don't want to fight you. You want to fight? All right, let's do it. Who do you think will win? Okay, if anyone said the lanky person, we'll pray after. But <laughs> it was Mike Tyson, right? Guys, do you realize your problems are like that lanky, untrained person fighting God who's like Mike Tyson in this story? Guys, your problems will never be stronger than God. If your problems were personified in some guy in a boxing ring, Jesus is knocking them out every single time. In fact, your problems can't even touch Jesus. We got to live like Jesus is our bodyguard. Sometimes you just, I just got to say it like that. Just, he's your bodyguard. And if Christ is with you, who can be against you? So your circumstances should not overwhelm you with fear. If this amazing warrior king called Christ is by your side. And more than Mike Tyson, this king didn't beat up a man. He beat death. Death got beat up by Jesus. He killed death by rising from the grave. And saying that all who believe in him will not feel the sting of death, but have everlasting life. If I went to a hospital right now, do you know what the biggest fear is in every single hallway, most likely? Death. You know what every doctor's trying to do? Save someone from death. But here's the truth to every person in that building. None of you are Christ. None of you could actually save anyone from this shadow of death. It's coming whether people want it or not. There's no medicine that's going to stop this thing from coming. Hardships are coming. And death being the main hardship is coming to you whether you like it or not. Death will knock at your door one day. But there's a Savior who beat that thing up. There's a Savior who rose from the grave. And there's a Savior who's telling you that he is your strength through all trials and tribulations. Do you trust him? You see, the peace is in him. Not in what he provides. It's him. As a pastor, as a preacher, I hate, I mean, I hate the prosperity gospel. I hate it. It's a lie from hell. It's a lie that men are getting up on stage left and right telling people God wants you to live a quote-unquote prosperous life. And if you really have enough faith in your life, you'll never be sick, you'll never be poor, and you'll never face trials. 
then how come Paul faced those trials? Why is Paul, the apostle of Christ, one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, in jail? And why is Paul bearing the marks of Christ, is what he says? And why is Paul going through seasons where he's hungry? And why is Paul going through seasons where he has nothing? Are we to believe we're better than Paul? I mean, look at your life. Compare your Christian walk with Paul. You suffer for Christ like Paul did? So Paul's suffering like this, and this false teaching would have people believe Paul just didn't have enough faith. You're crazy. That's blasphemous to the fullest extent. On the contrary, Paul proved his faith. Because when it all went dark, he still believed. When everything was gone, he knew Christ was enough. Because Christ was his strength. If this building didn't exist, would you still come? If the AC didn't work, would you still drive here tonight? If there was no PowerPoint, you just heard me in a park yelling at you, Jesus is king. And your friends and everyone in the community heard us. Would you be embarrassed? You'd be surprised how people even in this room would probably not come. What I'm trying to tell you is this. We should prepare ourselves for a Christianity that's ready for all circumstances. Praise God we have this room and this building. Praise God. But if we didn't have it, we could still look at each other and say, you're still my brother, you're still my brother, you're still my sister. The church is us. And Christ is our treasure. And we'll still gather together and praise the name of all names because he is worthy. The prosperity gospel teaches otherwise, that godliness is gain. The truth is, God and his will will allow you to live through whatever he pleases for his glory. Some of you will go through seasons. Listen to me now. I am warning you now. Before anyone else tell you, some of you will go through seasons where hardships will come. Because they will. Some of you will go through seasons where even you will sit there going, what has happened to my family, to my life, to my finances, to my career? What is going on? That's going to happen. And for others of you, that may not happen. It will. It may. All I'm trying to get you to understand and prepare yourself is this. Christ should be your refuge. And Christ should be the backbone that you confide in all things. Not the possessions and the things. Just Christ. So where is your faith when it all goes away? And also, where is your faith when it all comes? Because everyone loves to talk about, oh yeah, when you lose all things, you should trust in Christ. But I think it's also important to understand, when all these things come, do you give thanks to Christ? Some of you have cars. You know there's people in this room that carpool? Do you thank God for your car? Some of you are going to go to a bed tonight and not have to share it in a room with other people. There are people in this room that have one-bedroom houses. You grateful? You give thanks to Christ? Some of you are going to eat tonight, and I hope all of us eat tonight. <laughs> there's enough pizza for everyone. But there's some of us who are struggling to eat, and some of us here who are gluttonous. And we should be repenting of that because that's a sin too. I'm just trying to get to the heart of the matter that says this. Your possessions, whether they come or they go, can you be like Paul and have the confidence to say, I'm content because of Jesus. God, you could take it all away. I have everything in Christ. If I got to live like Job where it all goes away and I don't know what's going on, and maybe that's you right now. You have no idea what's going on. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to trust in Jesus. You know why? Because he says this, and I hope you believe this. He says he's going to wipe every tear from your eyes. That's the promise. Revelations 21.4. He's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. And suffering will be no more. And death shall be no more. For all the former things will pass away. And you want to know something glorious? He will make all things new. You got a family member in the hospital? I can't promise you that they're going to be healed in this life. But if they trust in Christ, I promise you this. They will be healed in the next life. You're wrestling with finances. You don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going to happen to your life. But here's what I know. Jesus says that he's preparing many rooms for all who trust in him. And that's going to matter more than anything. It's going to be with him. 
Christian, do you believe that Christ is enough? Do you believe that he is worthy? Philippians 4 emphasizes the believer's ability to overcome challenges with the strength that is given by Christ. It does not guarantee superhuman abilities or immunity to hardships, but rather the promise of strength to face and endure life's difficulties faithfully. Our Jesus, our Lion of Judah, is with us to fight all battles. Not some, all. So don't think, well, this isn't a spiritual battle. I won't give this to God. Give it all to God. Every single problem in your life, don't think you're here to solve it. There's a Savior. That's his job. Give it to him. And I promise you, he will always solve it. Because he already solved it at the cross by defeating the grave. Guys, do you realize there's like a part of us as Christians where we're kind of like, we should be living fearless. Like everyone else is just worried and we're just like, be good. I'm all right. The economy is going, this is going, everything, man, we're, I'm all right. Why are you all right? My kingdom isn't of this world. My kingdom is in heaven with Christ. Do you live like that? You realize some of the things I'm telling you right now, some people will call it radical, but as far as I'm concerned, it's just biblical. You know, what, what's really radical is when I compare Christians like Paul looking at the American church today and people like us thinking we're like them and we're not. Could you imagine being a first century Christian, being persecuted, seeing how comfortable we are? Can you imagine being a Christian in the first century whose family is being murdered at the Colosseum, killed for Christ? And then staring at some of you who can't pray or read your Bibles and do things for Christ on the daily basis in the times of peace. If we can't in the times of peace, then what in the times of war? If we can't in the midst of our comfort seek for Christ, then what happens in the midst of our desolations and our ruins and our travesties? God says if you are faithful with little, he will bless you with much. But if you're not faithful with little, what then? What could God do with you? You can't evangelize now when there's no persecution. You're going to think you're going to have the courage to evangelize then? You don't pray now, but you think you'll pray then? So in this season of your life right now, are you running to Christ alone? And are you realizing that Christ is the only strength you got? I'm convinced that God is looking for needy followers who are desperate of him alone. Those are the ones that he uses. He's not looking for people who think they're, they're not needy and they're okay. God's like, I can't do anything with you. Look to the one who says, I need you. I really need you. God says, good, good. I'm going to use you. And I will show you wonders if you trust in me. And if you realize that I alone am your satisfaction. Abundance does not strengthen the believer, neither does poverty. The only thing that strengthens the believer is Christ. Paul calls to Christ and proclaims, his, pro proclaims him as his fortress and his strength, which leads to our final reflection tonight. Contentment does not nullify need. Contentment does not nullify need. If you look at verses 15 through 20, listen to what it says. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church centered in partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Contentment does not mean you have no needs. On the contrary, rather, contentment indicates a trust in God who will see your needs. A trust in God who will take care of your needs. A trust in God who will use the people in your life to uplift you. It doesn't mean I'm content, therefore I'm so strong, I should not tell anyone that I need help. Consider Paul with the church of Philippians. Look at verse 16. 
Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. No one helped Paul. And Paul was in need of help. So Paul didn't look and say, I'm content in Christ to the point that I don't ask people for help. On the contrary, I'm content in Christ and I know Christ will supply help. I'm content in Christ and I know he sees my need. So don't think that because you're content that it means you don't ask God anything in prayer. That's foolish thinking. Jesus says you don't have because you don't ask. Ask. Tell the Lord what you need. Tell him that you need him. Tell him that you need this prayer answered. Tell him that you're desperate for comfort and joy. Tell him to surround you with people who can help you. That's one of the most courageous things you could ever say out of your mouth in this life. I really believe is just help. It takes courage. It takes courage to look at another person and say, can you help me? Because we live in a society where everyone's conditioned to think they should be independent and be self-sufficient. Guys, that's foolish. Christ brought the church together to help each other. To actually take care of each other's needs. The Bible says that the church of Acts, they would literally give offerings to help each other's needs. No one went starving in the church. We should be helping each other and not realize that though we are content, we shouldn't ask for help. So don't think contentment leads to arrogance. On the contrary, it leads to faith in God to supply for your every need. And not worrying. But being like the birds, trusting God will bring the bread somehow in some way. I know he will. I know he'll send that Christian who will give me $5 for gas today. Don't know how, but he'll do it. I know he'll, he'll provide food somehow in some way. Don't know how, but I trust my God. He's going to listen to me. He's going to give me some food. I've had moments like that in my life, you guys. I've had moments, I promise you, I remember being in college, not having one dollar in a financial way that takes everything away. And I remember just being there, it's like, man, Lord, I would love a burger. It's all right, Lord, I'll just fast today. <laughs> and then some random person, brother in Christ usually, it was probably Alex half the time, but anyways, someone would come in Christ and just be like, hey, I want to spot you today for some food. I'm trying to imitate Alex, because he used to do it all the time. But God would just provide a burger. I remember sometimes being in church service, weird, this is my God who answers prayers, being in church service, sitting down, just being like, man, I, I'm like craving Chipotle, that'd be awesome, funny, I know, weird, but specific, and then my sister just bumped me like, hey, I want to get some Chipotle, <laughs> she hates Chipotle, and I was like, yeah, cool, let's get it, and then I'll be eating and telling her, you know what's weird, I kind of talked to God about this, and we're eating it, <laughs> she's like, well, that's awesome, God is good. I think that's between you and God. If you're fasting in that scenario, you have to ask the Lord what the Lord wants. Because sometimes you got to just be strong enough to tell the brother, not now. You know, just wash your face and don't tell them what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if they, if they give you food, man, that's awesome. That's awesome. But the point, the point is this. God listens to our prayers, guys. And God supplies to our every single need. And having contentment doesn't mean that we don't have them. It means we trust in a God who will supply to them. Not in the way that we want, in the way that he wants, which is the other lesson too. Because maybe let's see that story, like I want a burger, and God's like, you're not getting a burger. <laughs> not today. And that's okay. Sometimes we're in those positions. We want these specific things, and God says, that's not how it works. It's not that you just get whatever you want. I'm not Santa Claus. This isn't how it works. It's do you trust me and trust whatever I give you because I know your needs. Sometimes you don't even know your needs. Now, there's this famous story where Jesus talks about prayer, and he compares it to a child going to a father's house. He goes, what child going to his father's house? He knocks in the middle of the night, and he says, Father, give me some water. And the father goes, hey, here's a snake. No, no father would do that. He's going to give his child water. Or he goes, well, what, what, what child, if he goes to his father's house, hey, Dad, can you give me some bread? I'm hungry. He's going to come out and, and give him a scorpion. That's what Christ says. He goes, a, a father, if your earthly fathers gave good gifts, you don't think our heavenly father would? That's what Christ says. You know what Christ is going to do? He's going to give you bread and he's going to give you water because he knows your needs. You know what the problem is? Sometimes God supplies the need and you call it a scorpion. 
Sometimes God actually gives you bread and you call it a snake. Sometimes God is giving you exactly what you need and you're just not grateful because you're prideful. So you tell God, God, this is what I need. And God goes, you know what you need? The Bible is what you need. You know what you need to go to church is what you need. You know what you need is to stop hanging around with these people who don't love me because they're leading you astray. You know what you actually need? To get on your knees. You're praying for everyone else, but what about you? You know what you actually need? To know that I'm Lord of your life. Not some of your life, but all of your life. And you know what else you need? Me. And nothing can compete with me. Are you satisfied with that? Ask yourself, don't look at the person next to you. Is Christ your satisfaction? And are you content in Him? And do you need Him? Absolutely. So don't think you're this tough person that doesn't have any need. No, you're a broken person created to need God who made you. And He's a good Father and He wants you to need Him. He loves when you need Him. Guys, I think like any father, I, I'm not, I got some parents here. Alex, how's it going? Right? I'm sure Alex would bring him joy if his children tell him, I need you, Dad. Because you know what a father's greatest joy is? That their children would still want them and need them. Guys, what about our Heavenly Father? You don't think our Heavenly Father loves it when we draw near to Him in our need? And you look at Paul's life, and Paul's a perfect example. God supplied to every need. God used this church to fund His ministry when no one else did. God used these brothers to pray for Him when everyone else probably abandoned Him. And it's the same for you in your life. God will send Christians your way to help you and strengthen you. And God is sending them your way to uplift you and to draw near to Christ. But are you willing to even listen to that counsel of those brothers? If anyone else, just take this as the last thing I'll say to you tonight. If anyone tells you to go to any other place but Christ, don't listen to them. Even if it offends them. I invite you to offend them. But if anyone comes to you saying, you know what you need? You need Jesus. It's not mom and dad. It's not medication. It's not therapy. It's not school. It's not, you just need Jesus. Go to Christ. Let him sustain you. Let him help you. He knows your needs and learn to be satisfied in him because his living water will never have you thirsting again. So why don't we stand and end with prayer? I'm going to ask the worship band to come up. And we're going to pray real quick. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, Lord, we thank you because you are king and ruler. God, you came into the world to lay down your life for sinners on the cross. You came for the broken. We thank you for finding us, Lord. You're the treasure. We only need you, Christ. Father, help us in our trials and in our tribulations to have faith. Not knowing what happens next, but knowing that you know all things. Help us to trust in you above all things. Teach us to be satisfied in Christ. To not draw to anything else but Jesus. That when we're facing the lowest of lows to the highest of highs, we're grateful for Christ. And not the things in our life, but the Savior who is everything. Strengthen this church. That even in the time of peace now, we would be your people. But God, even if persecution and bad things would happen, I just pray that a congregation like this would be as strong as they are now. That we would still gather and love you faithfully. Help us to be true men and women of God. I'm so tired of phoniness and fakeness, God. Help us to be real and vulnerable and broken. And if there are things we have to repent of, maybe even here in this sermon, some of us, we're just not trusting in you, God. There's moments I don't even trust you, God. I want to repent of that, God. I want to turn away from that. I want to draw near to Christ, that he would be my treasure, Father. Make him the treasure of all of our lives. And help us worship you now, Lord, in Jesus' name.